You're listening to the Braver Angels podcast, new way of talking politics. I'm your host, John Wood Jr. Nick Gillespie, hmm. how you doing, man? I'm doing pretty well. Yeah. I think I'm doing better than the country. Yeah, is yeah. that so? Is yeah, that so? I'm not at war with myself. <laughs> I've, I've given up and condi- you know unconditionally surrendered to that, to my uh, worst and best instincts. So. That, that's right. Well, you you practice a, a humane uh, policy of self governance. <laughs> I, I try to. Yeah, and uh, you. I think you managed to keep the peace with uh, the folks you interact with, although maybe some people would uh, disagree with me on that front. I'm not, yeah. not 100%, 100% uh, well, sure. Well, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a big fan, uh, you know, as a kind of professional libertarian as well as a journalist and commentator, uh, parents, you know, citizen, you name it. Um, it's, you know, I'm much more interested in kind of conversation than in um, lectures, mm-hmm. either giving or receiving. And... Uh, I also, uh, you know, I, I'm a hardcore believer in pluralism and tolerance. So, mm. especially with people that you don't disagree with, I think it's important to engage people honestly and respectfully and and peaceful, peaceably. Mm. Beautiful. Well, you're starting us off on some familiar notes mm-hmm. here. Um, so go ahead, and uh, I could have introduced you, but I thought, given the fact that you're here, right. I would go ahead and let the person most qualified. That to do sounds so. to me like, <laughs> do and so I don't want to himself. engage in bad faith I, arguments, but it sounds like somebody didn't prepare. But uh, no, what? No, uh, no, by no means. By yeah. no, I will tell people that Nick Gillespie is, uh, in my opinion, one of the most fashionable yeah. folks in political oh. commentary, yeah. and I mean that. I mean that literally. Every time I see you, I think there's the dude from the Matrix who always has something interesting <laughs> to say about how we need to unplug from the system. So yeah. I've got a strong uh, aesthetic sense of Nick Gillespie. And I think that most, uh, many people will know your name, mm-hmm. know you as uh, editor at large at Reason Magazine, mm-hmm. one of the foremost libertarian voices in the country. Uh, but, you know, having demonstrated that I have some basic yeah. grasp uh-huh. of the of the basis. You showed me up. Well, I, how do you introduce yourself? Yeah, you know, I'm I'm a, a journalist at mm-hmm. Reason. I make, uh, I write articles, I mm-hmm. uh, make videos and podcasts. And I, I been at Re- Reason was established in 1968. It's the premier libertarian political and cultural magazine in the country. Mm-hmm. Started in 1968. Um, I've been there for a long time. And um, you know what we're trying to do is kind of um, figure out what is a way that society, uh, including the political class as well as cultural class and economics, and you know the whole shebang, religious communities. Um, everything like how do we get along as peacefully as possible as pros- uh, uh, while being prosperous, innovative, inclusive, empathetic. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that for me, the libertarian philosophy is something that I um, kind of stumbled across when I was in high school. I started mm-hmm. reading Reason in high school. And um, it's about voluntary exchange. Our subtitle at Reason is Free Minds and Free Markets. Mm-hmm. And what we mean by that is that kind of civil rights and economic rights and cultural rights are all intertwined. Mm. And, um, you know, that it's better to, you know, try and figure out what what needs to be done as uh, in a consensus way mm. politically, because politics is a zero sum game uh, where 50 percent of the population plus one vote gets to tell the other people, not without limits, but with a lot of force, you know, how to live your life what is acceptable, what isn't. There are places where we need to have that consensus, but it should be as small a part of our overall lives as possible because most of our lives is not spent in, um, you know, in zero sum situations. Mm. If we're, if, you know, in our economy, you know, the fact that you do well doesn't mean I do less well. It oftentimes means I do well as, as well. Mm. Um, in our cultural arenas, I can like whatever I want. And it doesn't force you to watch what I like or like what I like or anything. So that's one of the ways that we talk about stuff at Reason. You said the Reason magazine was founded in 1968. Yeah. Uh, When was uh, National Review established? Uh, 1955. 1955. Yeah. And then then there's like the New Republic, which is kind of the granddaddy of the liberal Mm -hmm. semi-progressive magazines is back in the 19 teens, late teens, early 20s. Mm. The Nation, which is a more of a hardcore left magazine, goes back to, I believe, before the Civil War, just after it. So Mm. So, so let's let's situate um, Mm -hmm. the libertarian movement in the context of sort of where it falls in dialogue with, I guess, let's say the conservative movement, the, the modern 
modern liberalism, mm-hmm. although perhaps that's yeah. getting increasingly difficult to yeah. define in 2021. But but jumping back uh, historically a little bit, what is the founding of Reason Magazine and sort of the more visible kind of rise of libertarian sort of thought in yeah. American political discourse? What is that reacting to on the right uh, and on the and on the left? What what are the conversations right. happening in which space? that voice uh, takes the stage. Yeah, and uh, you know that's a great way to talk about everything because um, the story that I'll tell about that is essentially that um, reason and the libertarian movement more broadly after World War II um, rolled mostly with conservatives, and that mm-hmm. was because the overwhelming commitment that I think most people were making and who were conservative or, or libertarian was against communism, was against the Soviet Union. Mm. With the collapse of international communism, and particularly you know, the Soviet version uh, in the uh, early 90s, the um, coalition between conservatives and libertarians has frayed. And then mm. in different ways, it's also become increasingly impossible for libertarians to ally with the left. Um, and But in 1955, when William F. Buckley and a couple of other people, including a guy named Frank Meyer, founded National Review, Meyer was the um, kind of uh, um, uh, his his main theory was what he called fusionism, which was a, a combination. He was more libertarian than conservative, and he, um, uh, you know, but it was libertarians and conservatives had much more in common, and they came from a common stock, which mm-hmm. was mostly against socialism. Um, and the one of the reasons why I think libertarians and conservatives got along uh, pretty well during the Cold War was because th- there was a widespread belief that there was an existential threat coming from the Soviet Union and the mm-hmm. way that that was also warping or affecting um, traditional liberalism, uh, you know, in, 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 um, in the free world and in the United States. Liberalism being the idea of, you know, individual autonomy as much as possible, a limited government, kind right. of freedom to try things. Mm-hmm. And it had it had been creeping more and more towards socialism or, or bigger and bigger government telling people more and more. Conservatives famously, you know, uh, William F. Buckley said that National Review stood athwart history yelling stop. <laughs> um, right. which in a way, you know, when I look back at it, I was born in 1963 and I've never been a conservative or a leftist. I've just been a libertarian without adjectives too, without modifiers. I'm like, man, you know, I don't want to yell stop. Like I, you know, cause libertarians believe in the future. They believe in innovation. They believe that things change, times change. And that, you know, the way people deal with each other and the, and how businesses work, everything is about change mm-hmm. as long as it's voluntary and as long as people are free to opt in or opt out. Um, but what happened over time was that the, you know, I think it was revealed over the course of the Cold War and especially the, you know, the past 30 years or so, is that conservatives were against communism probably as much as for any other reason because it was godless, whereas for mm-hmm. libertarians, there's a lot of um, atheists who are libertarians, a lot of believers. I know a lot of Christians and a lot of Jews uh, and actually a fair amount of Muslims who call themselves libertarian. But there isn't this belief that the state should be um, supporting religion or that the state should necessarily be an instrument of moral instruction, which I think conservatives tend to believe in. And after the Soviet Union collapsed, a lot of the uh, conflicts about social issues, as well as capitalism, because libertarians tend to be more um, okay with a capitalism that you know will produce anything anybody wants. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you see in places like National Review and the old Weekly Standard, which you know folded a few years ago, but was mm-hmm. another variation of a right. conservative magazine. They used to run a lot of stuff about how, you know, the the libertarian temptation, they would call it. And, you know, the problem with, <laughs> with libertarians is you believe in markets and markets are really good at delivering things that people don't, you know, that they think people shouldn't be doing. Whether it's, you know, violent TV, whether it's certain types of music, whether it's sex work, uh, drugs, you name it. And libertarians generally have much more of a laissez-faire, hands-off. And so uh, there has, and then... The other large issue, I think, that continues to divide, ironically, after the end of the Cold War, is foreign policy. Mm -hmm. Uh, Conservatives tend to be much more interested in having a very um, powerful military that is not simply for defense, but is all over the world, making the world safe for democracy. Um, 
uh, that type of thing. And that has, especially after 9-11, that's become a real friction point uh, because libertarians tend to think government is, you know, ineffective at, at best, uh, you know, incompetent at worst or evil even in various things, trying to control people. It, it, you know, if we if California can't build enough houses for people in California to live in, how the hell right. are we going to restructure the world in places like Afghanistan, where even our leaders probably don't know more than three cities? Hmm. When did Ayn Rand write yeah. um, Atlas Shrugged? Uh, like 58, 59, I 58. guess it came out. I mean, she had been writing it for, mm -hmm. you know, a decade or so. And Rand, uh, you know, never rolled with concern. Well, she uh, she's a one-of-a-kind person, but she... Um, National Review famously panned Atlas Shrugged. They had Whitaker mm -hmm. Chambers, the great uh, anti, you know, communist turned anti-communist who wrote Witness, review the book, and he said, you know, and I'm paraphrasing a bit, but it was something like, from every page, you you hear the whisper to the gas uh, to the gas chambers go. I mean, mm -hmm. he thought Ayn Rand was an insane, mm -hmm. you know, nut job who was uh, had delusions of grandeur and would get rid of people she didn't like, uh, which is a bizarre read of her but <laughs> uh but she also hated libertarians on she called libertarians hippies of the left mm -hmm. and by the end of the 60s she was always kind of pointing out that all of these people she inspired and who loved her work and called themselves libertarians she didn't want anything to do with them. <laughs> well that kind of gets me to the uh uh the uh convergence that i wanted mm -hmm. to sure sort of i, I identify or, or locate wherever mm -hmm. it might happen to Start uh, because uh, Ayn Rand, of course, you know Atlas Shrugged. Right. Um, to your point about atheism being mm -hmm. very yeah. much present in libertarianism, although as you just mentioned, Ayn Rand mm -hmm. wouldn't have considered herself, I guess, a libertarian. Right, but in, but there's no question, libertarians did. and atheism. You know, there's a, there's a lot of overlap there. Well, right, and so in that book, you know, you you see a great focus on a great opposition to religion right. alongside the opposition to you know the, mm -hmm. the, the power of an overarching. Uh, government and state, and so one can see where libertarianism, or at least where that thinking seems to join forces with conservatism. Mm -hmm. Part of what I'm wondering, though, is that sitting here in 2021, you know, me, I'm uh, 30, uh, how old am I? I'm 34 years old, uh, spent a certain amount of time in politics, mm -hmm. uh, adjacent to folks who are activist libertarians mm -hmm. in the Ron Paul movement, mm -hmm. uh, you know, 2008 and 2012 and so forth. Um, I, I think that we tend to associate libertarian, uh, the libertarian movement with, yes, a small government philosophy on the mm -hmm. policy side, uh, but genuine sort of social liberalism, mm -hmm. you know, on the culture side and really sort of being allied to, a, you know, a way of looking at society that says, look, we need to have freedom of choice in terms of our religious and sexual mm -hmm. lifestyles, the substances yep. that we, you know, choose to recreate ourselves with or not. Um, is there, however, historically, is there a strong connection between, you know, uh, whether the birth of Reason magazine or just in general, the trajectory of the libertarian movement uh, coming out of the social movements of the 60s, the emphasis on, you know, free love, mm. experimentation, yeah. so on and so forth? Or are you saying that really that kind of cultural overlap is something that was sort of maybe established a bit later? Yeah, it's a, you know, is it kind of necessary? And, you know, the guy who started Reason Magazine, a character named Lanny Friedlander, uh, was a Randian. He was a, an objectivist. That's why the magazine is called Reason, because mm -hmm. right. Rand, you know, believes that reason, the, the faculty, our critical faculty, is what sets us apart as humans, mm -hmm. et cetera. Um, but he was also kind of like, you know, Robert Heinlein is uh, the science fiction writer who was, on the one hand, in a, in a lot of ways, he might be more of the spirit animal of kind of the libertarian movement where, mm. you know, on the one hand, he was like a, a strong cold warrior, but he was also an apostle of free love and all kinds of social experimentation, which you don't really see very much anymore. Um, nowadays, I think the libertarian movement is fairly well defined. And you bring up Ron Paul in mm. many ways, you know, his anti-interventionism is a big, big part of it. Um, but he's also hyper-religious. I mean, I, I I don't know exactly, but I wouldn't be surprised to mm -hmm. learn that he's a biblical literalist, um, not just a—I yeah. yeah, know he's a Baptist. Um, and, you know, this also, for me, um, the antagonism sometimes between religion and libertarianism pains me, partly because 
I see the way that I read the the long term movement of classical liberalism and the idea of getting rid of a government uh, where you know the king gets to decide everything mm-hmm. or you know a largely unlimited mm-hmm. government is really rooted in the religious war in England in the 17th century, the, mm-hmm. uh, you know between Cromwell and Charles the first, and you know, mm-hmm. um, and that it it stems in a lot of ways. I mean, not to get too deeply theological about it, but it, from a kind of Protestant reading of the idea that every every individual, including women in the 17th century, my ex-wife is a scholar of the period and has done a lot of work on this, but that, you know, each of each of us is equal before God and mm-hmm. no man has dominion over another man or woman, and that it's all about kind of individual rights mm-hmm. and the ability to worship or not according to your own individual will and then also that all kinds of affiliations, starting with religious ones, but going to everything else, should be voluntary, essentially. Mm. Right, right. Now, is there, when we think about libertarianism, I think people will recognize it as a cultural force. Mm. And, I, you know, I... I and how do you mean? Well, just in the sense that I think that whether you're looking at the left or at the right... Yeah. You'll you'll tend to have more people say that they have some libertarian right. sentiments, than will necessarily adopt the tag of libertarian yep. Yep. through and through. Right? Uh, libertarians are very popular uh, when when you know outside of elections, <laughs> right. because then uh, we're always the ones. Because your candidate <laughs> yeah. sucks and loses, you blame it, and they couldn't cover the spread of like third party votes. You blame it on libertarians. But you know, when you're at parties, people are always like, Oh, well, you know, I'm I have some libertarian leanings and then they're <laughs> yeah, you know, they're the, getting around to ask yeah, whether exactly. or not that's, you're yeah. carrying something or something. But, <laughs> well yeah. that's 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 precisely precisely my point. Yeah. Libertarians seem to mm-hmm. be, you know, fun to have at the right. parties and so forth. Right. Because everybody can find something to agree with libertarians yes. on. Right. And yet something about that whole package mm-hmm. of perspectives, as we've come to understand it, has not really been able to gel into sort of a political. Yeah. You know, force uh, and and in a, cu- a couple of ways, too, because mm-hmm. politically, you know, there's the Libertarian Party, which has been around since 1971. And um, reason, you know, I, I mean, I almost always vote for a libertarian candidate if, mm-hmm. if, if I'm voting in a particular election right. and there's a, a libertarian candidate. But we have no actual affiliation with them. We're a nonprofit. Right. We don't, you know, endorse, uh, you know, particular candidates. And, and you yourself, have you uh, registered? Or I'm not registered a registered libertarian. libertarian. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I don't I'm I'm almost certain that I registered as a libertarian at some point when I was younger. But I just I don't, you mm. know affiliate really with any party i consider myself independent but like i said i vote anytime there's a libertarian on the ballot i'll vote mm. for them on my sight unseen right. uh, but you're right you know there's the libertarian party which has done pretty well in the past couple of elections but you know it's it's like you know it peaked at what like three or four percent of the popular vote uh mm. in 2016 under gary johnson right um, and it's not yet a major, um, you know, partisan force. There is a cultural force to libertarianism uh, or to libertarian ideas of people saying, you know, I want more freedom. I want to be left alone. I want to be able to, uh, you know, I, I don't want the government or or big tech really like censoring what I say or what I can produce, th- mm-hmm. things like that. Politically, um, I think libertarians have, uh, you know, part of the problem is is that we're selling, you know, I think as as a unified field theory of reality, we're mm-hmm. saying, you know, social liberalism, fiscal conservatism, kind mm-hmm. of. And it turns out that very few people are actually interested in that. And we're, you know, mm-hmm. we're witnessing that now where like a lot of, you know, liberals want to tell people how to talk, how to think, what they can watch, what they can't watch. And they want to spend a lot of money. Conservatives are so doing something similar like that they might there might be different shows they don't want you to watch or or this but and they want to spend a lot of money and like i think mm-hmm. you know this is part of the problem is that people you know at various points they'll be like well i want smaller government less taxes less government you know crowding government crowding everything out but um socially conservative mm-hmm. or you know vice versa or whatever but you rarely get people who are willing to say you know what i really want more freedom in all arenas of life and i want a government that spends less money even on people like me i sort of suspect that there might be two headwinds that are sort of present in in human nature and politics uh that might sort of blow against Mm -hmm. the prospects of building up a libertarian uh 
political movement right. that becomes electorally significant. One of those, I think, is what you're speaking to, and that's the fact that you know we we want freedom for ourselves, but when it comes to the power of the state, the mm -hmm. power of the public treasure chest, it's just so tempting to be able to use those funds on things that we find important, right. things that you know accumulate to our interests. Mm -hmm. And if folks think that using the power of the government to, in some way or the other, sort of regulate speech norms mm -hmm. or to, you know, throw into uh, the sort of, you know, corporate welfare yeah. system because you have economic interests attached to right. that. And so you We're, get somebody, if I may, like Marco Rubio, who's bugging me for a couple of reasons. He just wrote a terrible mm -hmm. column that I read. But, you know, he'll be like, I'm for free markets okay. and everything, you know, but not sugar. Because mm -hmm. sugar is a really essential factor in the American economy. And I happen to come from a state and a part of a state where there's a lot of sugar growing. Mm -hmm. And like I know that this is something that can't be trusted to the whims of the free market. But, mm -hmm. you know, you're in trucking or you're in dry cleaning. Like, yeah, yeah, that should be free market, but not my not my guys. Well, right. And so that's that's sort of the the, the ordinary yeah. tit for tat, you right. know, <clears throat> um, quid pro quo style of, of politics as we as we know it, even for folks who tend to campaign on the idea right. of generally disciplining uh, public spending, but then there's this this other thing that I that I'm curious to hear you respond to. You know, you think about politics in democracy. It, it I, I think it would be reasonable to think about this enterprise as being sort of you know group orienting and collective in nature, mm -hmm. right? I mean, the idea of being able to organize people around, a, you know, a social vision or a political agenda, you know, those relationships and organizing are frequently tied together by shared identities that will bring with them cultural norms that mm -hmm. may be attached to religion mm -hmm. and tradition and convention uh, or just group identity, right? Yeah. Whatever the case may be. And it seems like the appeal of libertarianism just on an elemental level lies in the fact that it is maximizing sort of our ability to be individuals mm -hmm. and to be free of perhaps, you know, maybe the negative ties that can be shackled to right. us by virtue of stale mm -hmm. traditions or group, you know, uh, interests that don't necessarily reflect my individual mm -hmm. values, right? So it's liberating. But on the other hand, does it not sort of set in place a psychological formula that makes it very difficult to bring a bunch of people who are prizing their right. individuality to pull together as a collective? Yeah, I, I, you cause? know, that's a pretty astute uh, critique. The one thing I will add, because that that is a kind of beneficent reading of it, I, I would also, mm -hmm. before we go to that, and I, I would like to talk about that a little yeah. bit, is also that a lot of libertarians are... Um, you know, when they talk about this stuff uh, politically, they're extremely dogmatic and the mm. way they are looking to kind of narrow the possible definition of a libertarian or, or the number of people who can participate. So I know a lot of like, you know, libertarian, small L libertarians will be here are 10 policy positions. And if mm. you don't agree, if you only agree with nine out of 10 or eight out of 10, like get the hell out, you know, you're not really libertarian. Oh, good. So libertarians are yeah. like the rest of us. Though. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, but you know, and, and a lot least, of libertarians, like I, I'm, yeah. you know, within the libertarian movement, I, I suspect I'm considered kind of a candy ass or a, a softy <laughs> because I'm not an anarchist. Like I, I, I'm, I'm not, you know, and it's like, I, I just don't care about like, you know, the foundational elements of some of this stuff, but mm. a lot of people are, you know, anarchists and that is a genuinely, that's a tougher is, sell. Is, is that a growing uh, constituency within the libertarian uh, You know, movement, that's an interesting question. I, I'm not sure, but... Because um, I'll, I'll I say that I associated with, or at least I had a lot yeah. of friends in the Ron Paul kind of yeah. you know, crowd who did identify themselves that way, but it wasn't right. a term I was f really familiar yeah. with before I met those folks on right. the ground. In other words, in my reading of history, I didn't right. really come across that too yeah, much. Yeah, I mean, America. I think it's more recent, and I think a lot of mm -hmm. it is related to the Ron Paul phenomenon, mm -hmm. um, you know, where, um, and, you know, he obviously is not an anarchist, but he was a mm -hmm. congressman for, you know, like a thousand years and things like that. But yeah. but there's a real kind of dogmatism that is a turnoff to a lot of people. And there, I think a lot of libertarians have kind of internalized the idea that this, it's not that it's a fringe uh philosophy because i think it's really central to the american experiment but that it is a small one and it's kind of like a vanguard thing so like we're mm -hmm. you know a lot of people are comfortable not having very many people qualify to be libertarians so i want to always you know 
if you're a salesman and like your product isn't selling, you can always blame the world and say like these people mm -hmm. just aren't ready for it, but it's like, maybe it's the product. Mm -hmm. So I'm willing to say that, you know, libertarians have to shoulder, uh, you know, if not all of the blame, like a large amount of it, if, if, if libertarianism isn't winning, having said that, so two things to get to your point. Yeah. One is that in many ways, libertarian policies, like I, you know, part of the thing, the reason why I'm a libertarian is because it's a political philosophy for people who don't want politics to govern every aspect of your life. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I, like I was saying, I want a politics where you need that consensus to be the smallest portion of you know what we're devoting our calories to every day so we can get on with the more interesting parts of our lives like building families building communities building houses businesses you know producing and consuming culture mm -hmm. all of that kind of stuff um and um you know in that um it, you're not going to get the type of um you know necessarily the, the types of people who are going to like put politics first and foremost sure. having said that in things like criminal justice reform and things like ending the drug war not simply so everybody can get high however they want, but so that all of the negative effects of prohibition, whether it's of alcohol or of weed or of even of heroin, all of those recede, you know, uh, uh, in terms of school choice, in terms of uh, freedom of labor and movement and anti-discrimination. You know, I think uh, treating people as individuals, I think libertarians have made massive um you know, gains, like, uh, you know, all of the stuff that's good in the world, I, you know, I would argue much of it is really libertarian policies, typically in an unacknowledged way, mm -hmm. actually taking the day. And let me just come back to school choice as, as an example of that. Um, you know, this is a place where it's, a, you know, a libertarian policy, Milton Friedman in the 50s came up with, you know, kind of jump started the modern school choice movement by suggesting that, you know, you, you take the money, the per pupil spending that governments at various levels are giving to, uh, you know, pay or giving to schools, give them instead to parents who can use them any, you know, in, to buy education wherever they find it for their kids. Yeah. That is gaining a big uh, ground. That is also the type of thing where, you know, libertarians who are into that, they want to build their own communities. Um, and that that's a, a kind of, to get back to your question of mm -hmm. like, is there something about libertarianism where, it's it can't it can help like kick over the old ossified remains of past societies and institutions mm -hmm. that are shackling people down but it can't really build the new world mm -hmm. i think you see in places like you know the school choice movement you see what a libertarian future might look like where it's it's and again to go it's funny i'm talking about protestantism mm -hmm. um you know but it's it's almost kind of like a, a protestant version of christianity where people are freer to affiliate with different churches as they change over mm -hmm. life like you you know you're never you're never trying to escape church you're just trying to find a better fit and, and you build a new community and i i see that coming out of something like the way libertarians talk about school choice it's not to escape society but it's to find one that you fit in better so it sounds like maybe part of what's implied by the way you're uh explaining this is to say that Maybe part of what's been missing with libertarianism is maybe an emphasis on the freedom it allows us to build community and mm -hmm. to imagine yeah. or to envision what community could look like. Right. At which point, you know, that way of treating libertarianism becomes philosophically a bit more appealing to a person like myself. I mean, sure. I sort of think of myself as, you know, generally speaking, being a person who's, you know, um, Actually, I always struggle to categorize myself a little yeah, bit. Yeah, well, well, we all people, do, right? Because yeah. we're unique. You know, well, other people, they can fit into pre-existing boxes. But, like, I need... Well, know. yeah, right, exactly. Yeah, but, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm a person who's yeah. got a, you know, a fairly... Uh, a foundation that is culturally traditional mm -hmm. in many respects. Right. At the same time, you know, I'm sort of cosmopolitan mm -hmm. in, in some ways and have, you know, grown up uh, with folks who lived life all sorts of yeah. different styles and fashions and has never really you know bothered me too terribly mm -hmm. much i do believe very much in community and i like the yep. idea of maximizing freedom so long as we also take on board sort of our moral and social and cultural responsibilities yep. to each other right and so having a vision of what that looks like, and you know, I, I sometimes use the word communitarian, although it's probably right. even less marketable than libertarian. You know? uh, you communitarians um, and libertarians are, you know, that's kind of like cats and dogs. In a, but it's, it's in, in a way, it's like if the community is freely chosen, mm -hmm. you know, that's a, that's a libertarian 
you know, version of communitarianism. And, um, you know, and, and I agree. I mean, I think that, you know, this is where, you know, somebody like Ayn Rand is mm. a pinata for this type of stuff, but, you know, where she just wanted to be left, she didn't want to have to deal with anything, mm. you know, other than her own genius. But, you know, and I'm not a particular fan of Rand. I mean, I'm not, I'm not, she isn't somebody, I, I come at libertarianism from mm-hmm. a different direction. Atlas but Shrugged even, was pretty impactful on yeah, me. I, but I, even I in that, say, yeah. I mean, like, you know, the uh, if I'm not, mm-hmm. you know, and I haven't read the full book, so, mm-hmm. I, you know, you would know better than me <laughs> that I've seen the movies. But, uh, you've you know, got it's you like... Got, you've got to carve out a couple of years of your life. All the, you know, all the you rich, you know, all the productive people who, you know, who leave, they go and form a, you know, a club, right? They're hanging mm. out in Galt's Gulch. They're not, mm. you know, they're not going to the Fortress of Solitude like Superman mm. or something. Right. Yeah. So that even in Ayn Rand, you know, people want to hang out with other people who are kind of like-minded and whatnot. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And, I, but I, I do agree that that's a, you know, there's a knock on libertarianism, which is not fully true but you know there's elements of it that it's like it's about you know wealthy privileged people mostly white often mm. who just don't want to have any responsibilities for anything that is such a fundamental misreading of, of mm-hmm. my experience in the mm. uh, libertarian community and it, it really is about you know kind of how do, how do you live in a world where you have you can build your traditions and you mm-hmm. can respect local control local knowledge um, local um, history, but then also participate in a cosmopolitan world and where the people who want to leave that small town, you know, can leave and go to the city if that's where they feel more at home and vice versa. Mm-hmm. Well, and at that point, it seems like what we're describing is kind of, in some respects, the sort of the the, the, the fundamental spirit of the American project yeah. and it's kind of federalist sort of, right. you know, uh, imagining. I mean, the idea, I think, behind the country to begin with was that you would have the different states that have their different mm-hmm. cultures and so forth. And, you know, there's an overarching constitution and bill right. of rights that we uh, adhere to. But beyond that, it's right. it's left to us to experiment and to build locally, right? right? The, the yeah. nature of our, of our uh, shared communities. I would think that in today's um, sort of universe of, of sort of, you know, polarization and, mm-hmm. and the way in which, so many of us feel like we're being pushed into differing sorts of cultural norms set by, you know, whether they're elites in Hollywood right. or, or in the church or people right. high up in government, that there would be appeal to that idea yeah. that we can co-create communities in ways that reflect, you know, the values of one group or another while still being in uh, good faith dialogue right. uh, with with others. So how does how does the the, the the technological kind mm-hmm. of universe that we exist in now interact with that vision of of society because we talk a lot about creating communities braver angels mm-hmm. is yep. itself a community that exists in physical spaces but we're tied together online right you know in all sorts of ways so what does that look like yeah you know in i i started at reason in the mid 90s and um you know this was also uh coincidentally the moment that the internet as the world wide web kind of became a uh, you know a global medium and a phenomenon and the cold war had ended and people were like holy cow we're you know we've put that behind us we we no longer are spending so much of our time and money and resources worried about a nuclear war or about like you know being taken over or taking over other places. And we got this tool that allowed us to connect virtually with people that we never would have found before. I was very much, and reason broadly, but I, you know, I can only really be responsible for what I wrote, was very optimistic about technology as a means of reducing um, you know, distance and, and people being able to find one another. And there's a lot of stories, and I take this um, you know, it, it, it really moves me when you, the old Usenet groups before there were kind of, you know, online f- or, or, you know, web forums and things mm. like that or social media, but people, you know, where there might be, I don't know, you know, like you're, you're in a small town and you're gay or, or you mm. like, let's like take it out of that. You like goth new wave music. Sure. Nobody in your town likes it. You don't know anybody who likes it. You can't even get it at local radio stores, Mm -hmm. but then you would go online and you would find a community of people who shared Mm -hmm. that interest. And suddenly your world became so much bigger and so much more interesting. And, and, and then you realize, well, I like goth, but I like this and I like that and, you know, whatever. And like, you're building out this whole new universe of connections Mm -hmm. that you, that was not possible, you know, without a certain kind of technology in place. 
we see this a lot with you know in in the past year because of the pandemic zoom went from you know being a little known company to becoming you know a major part of people's lives i don't think it is not a full replacement for mm-hmm. you know like in you know irl stuff in real life or face to face but it's pretty good and it allows us to collapse a lot of space and live in a lot of different places simultaneously mm-hmm. Um, so I think that's good. It also brings friction, you know, because you're talking, and, and Braver Angels is a lot about particularly political or ideological polarization. One of the flip sides of this is that um, sometimes people use that freedom to, um, you know, completely separate out of a world in which they are, um, you know, interacting with people they disagree with. Mm-hmm. Or, and yeah. this is where I, you know, I think this is the Democratic and Republican Party. And you can say that, you know, that's liberal and conservatives or whatever, but, um, you know, they are trying to win a battle. They're going to lose, but they are trying to control the conversations, control the connections, et cetera. And it's, you know, it's a particularly dumb battle to be fighting now, but it's also one where they can cause a lot of grief by trying to shut down people's abilities to interact and interconnect and kind of build new models that are neither right nor left. Mm. So what do you think accounts for the sort of exodus, I think, that Mm -hmm. we've generally seen over the last uh, several years from the major parties um, into either, you know, if not third parties, then just sort of the mass of independence that exists in in American uh, society? Yeah, and and there was a recent Gallup, you know, uh, does a political affiliation poll uh, every, you know, a couple times a year for, for over 50 years where they ask people, do you consider yourself a, a Democrat or a Republican? Yeah. And, um, you know, both of those parties are at or near record lows. And the most mm-hmm. recent one, Republicans came in at like 25% of the population, Democrats at 30%. My recent colleague and, uh, uh, Matt Welch and I wrote a book about a dozen years ago or 10 years ago called the Declaration of Independence. Mm-hmm. And it, it started from this you know, long time, long term trend going back to the early 70s of fewer and fewer people identifying as Democratic or Republican. You know, they still vote that way because those mm-hmm. are the only two real options. But of course, I think, you know, what what's going on is that these political parties get put into place and they're a loose assemblage of positions that are not, you know, they're not idi- they're not theoretically um, consistent but they serve to knit together special interests in a way that you would get a workable majority to get most of your stuff done. Mm-hmm. And those, major, you know, the people that these parties represented are dead or, you know, they, they didn't make it out of the 20th century, but mm-hmm. we're still living as if. Um, and they have a lot of money and they have a lot of power be, and they get taken over increasingly by the way that, you know, the, the people who run them are more extreme. The, a Democratic Party activist is more to the left than a regular Democratic Party rank and file right. member or voter. Same on the Republicans going right. Yeah. And so as people are fleeing them, they simultaneously, it's the dead enders who are left and who are getting more and more extreme. And so they are, you know, we're at a place now where the, um, you know, the, the current conversation in Congress is how do you pass major transformational legislation without you know, along strict party lines. Mm -hmm. And that's a major reversal of the political process where it was like, okay, how do you, you know, the whole point of the big legislation, you know, is that you would have 75% of the House or the Mm -hmm. Senate voting for it because it had to be consensus driven. And Mm -hmm. now it's like, no, we're going to pack the courts. We're going to get rid of the filibuster. We're going to bring it back for this. We're going to add DC, you know, to the, to the uh, states. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're going to do all sorts of things to work around the fact that we really don't represent a majority of people with our agenda, but we're going to push it through. Right. So that reflects, I think, uh, kind of a breakdown of trust that exists, yeah. you know, between uh, the the American people fundamentally. Mm-hmm. And so the business model uh, has now sort of centered around our ability to create coalitions just barely sufficient to allow us right. to get to... 50 plus one to win a certain, mm-hmm. you know, a certain seat in office or 50 plus one in order to pass. Or, you know, or 49.9. I mean, like, you know, this is, mm-hmm. it's, you know, I mean, the 20th, 21st century has been remarkable in the number of, you know, the presidency keeps switching, uh, the control of the House, control of the Senate. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, they're flip flopping back and forth every couple of years. And it's mm-hmm. because each time a party gets into office, 
it, you know, barely or or with pretty good win. You know, mm. the Democrats did well in 2006. The Republicans did well in 2010. They go extreme, they blow it, and then you know it starts over and over again. And nobody in the major parties um, has come up with an agenda that will actually appeal to you know 55 percent of the population. Mm. Right. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> one thing I wonder is if in this state of affairs, do we still have what I think you know, populists right and left mm -hmm. would have referred to as an establishment, basically, mm -hmm. made up of the elites in both parties that in one way or the other are conspiring to maybe prevent progress in this mm -hmm. area or that area, but who basically agree on the things that keep, let's say, working class folks and even middle class mm -hmm. folks kind of, you know, in one way or another in debt unable to rise up the uh, social and economic ladder. Um, there has been this, this sense that the people who run the parties agree on the things that matter most to them while posturing social wars for everybody else right, right. to keep us sort of politically divided and, and hurtable as, 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 yeah, vote, as you know, it's, cattle. it's an interesting question. And like, mm -hmm. I think, um, does you that know, analysis hold? Yeah, I, I mean, hold? I, I want to say yes. And that, mm -hmm. you know, ultimately, like, you know, the skirmishes between Democrats and Republicans or, you know, uh, like poor whites and Black Lives Matter, this is, mm -hmm. you know, that the elites are using that to kind of keep our minds off the idea that they're running all of us, you know, and mm -hmm. that the real divide isn't right and left, but it's like upper and lower. Mm -hmm. And I think in terms of the federal government, at least, you see certain elements of that when, you know, Donald Trump, uh, said, you know, I'm going to get out of Afghanistan, I'm going to get out of Syria, like suddenly you saw a consensus among Washington elites on, mm -hmm. you know, in both parties that were, that was pretty striking, really, mm -hmm. you know, and it's like clear that they were against that, um, mm -hmm. you know, but in other ways, I think what we're more witnessing is, you know, there is an establishment, there are elites, there are, there's inertia but I think in many ways there has been a breakdown in, you know, in what people, you know, a large consensus of what will help people. So um, going back, and this was something after World War II, it took decades to build up a consensus that um, immigration was generally good for the country mm. and that free trade was good. And, you know, this was something what, you know, Ronald Reagan and George H.W. Bush were the, the end of that for Republicans where they, you know, they in, instituted free trade policy. They talked about it openly. And then, um, but it was Bill Clinton and the Democrats who like pa ultimately passed NAFTA, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and Al Gore, you know, took on um, H. Ross Perot, who was talking about the giant sucking sound in Mexico. Like there was mm -hmm. a consensus that among liberals, conservatives, Democrats, Republicans, that free trade was good. I don't know that there is a consensus anymore in that. Um, and I, I would tend to believe, you know, I think free trade is good. Well, President Trump and maybe community. Bernie Sanders, too. Yeah, this is a, help you know, demolish but, that. Consensus, yeah. And, you know, and it's also interesting now that Joe Biden, you know, got into office running against Trump and saying, you know, he's all wet about trade and immigration, but then he's not actually changing a lot of the policies. Hmm. Um, but what I'm getting at is that um, I think we are, Kind of, you know, in, in a soccer game, um, uh, you know, there's, uh, the, you know, they show the time, you know, on TV, but then the refs are keeping a separate time that you don't know how much, like, the mm -hmm. clock has ended on TV, but, and there's some bit of, of, of <laughs> limit before, you sure. don't know if it's like three minutes, five minutes, seven minutes, depending on how the, we're holding the time. We're kind of in that moment where, like, all of the 20th century stuff that had been hammered out has, like, died. It doesn't make sense anymore, but we don't know when things are really going to stop and, mm. and the 21st century is really going to start in earnest. But, and I think with, you know, free trade, with immigration, with um, a lot of verities that we took for granted, free speech. I mean, we're having more conversations, not simply about what is or is not free speech, but is free speech good? Right. You know, on both the right and the left, like that, you know, that was something that I, I would have thought was settled as settled as free trade being a good thing for poor people. Mm. You know, suddenly people are arguing about whether or not free speech is a good thing. Mm. Um, so we, you know, this is exactly the moment when I guess from a braver angels kind of perspective, you know, this is exactly the moment we need really robust and good faith conversation mm. because there is a lot of disagreement. And of course it also kind of reflects the fact that, 
so many of our institutions, our trust and confidence in institutions has broken down that we can't have those conversations, or we're not having those conversations in the way that we should. Right. Well, one of the areas where the sort of misalignment between Americans on whether or not we should be allowed to say certain things mm-hmm. is most striking is in, you know, conversations having to do with race and mm-hmm. identity, I think, yeah. um, uh, in particular in American life. And you can see, you know, these massive kind of shifts taking place in the institutions where mm-hmm. in you know Hollywood and the tech platforms uh, and on campuses, you know, there are certain norms. In some cases, yeah. it may be policy. Other cases, it may just be severe social pressure. Right. But people are reacting against the idea that you can't say certain things. Right. right? Then you see a guy like Bill Maher and so forth on yeah. HBO who is kind of uh, gone into this new phase of his career being a champion for our ability right. to sort of say what we want to say. And, you know, I guess he's representing a certain flavor of libertarian backlash against uh, yeah. against I, that. He's that, great that on trend. free speech. And, you know, I've been mm-hmm. on his show a bunch of times over the past 10 or 15 years. And he's, you know, I mean, this version of him I like a lot because mm-hmm. he's really focusing on, you know, trying to say things, you know, like people are afraid to say what they really think because mm-hmm. of social backlash. Um, and sometimes corporate backlash, you know, where if you say the wrong thing in the wrong place, you're going to be canceled. And that means not just that you're not going to get a lot of Christmas cards, although, no, you know, even though nobody celebrates Christmas anymore mm-hmm. in the same way, it's, you know, but you're going to be fired, you know, and your life is going to be made miserable. And so I think that's great. I think, you know, the more interesting question about this kind of stuff is I think, you know, people always worry about things like the N word or, you know, like, we, well, we can't have honest discussions about race and the way that it mm-hmm. inter- intersects with economic opportunity, policing, history, all of these things important. But then when you look at something like, uh, you know, the way the NBA, the way that certain kinds of online gaming mm-hmm. systems, um, uh, you know, are saying, you know, basically policing in the, you know, on the one hand, they're saying we want our players to be able to protest and to speak their mind on politics. Sure. As long as they're not talking about the Chinese government, Mm -hmm. you know, because then, you know, then you really will get into trouble. So it's like, okay to, to demonstrate when the national anthem's playing, but don't freaking say anything bad about China because we've got a really big deal cooking there and stuff like that. It becomes a different commercial calculus. Yeah, and it's point. like those are actually ultimately the kinds of things that are going to get us into more and more trouble in terms of just being free and being willing and able to kind of talk about stuff and, and to name the things that are bugging us. So, so how much is... Our, and I'm sorry, uh, if yeah. I may, you know, the other thing that I want to, I guess, you, just as a kind of like throw all of this stuff out on the yeah, table no, and then we can mm-hmm. pick through it and see what's <laughs> worth, uh, sure. you know, dilating on. But right, right. it, um, you know, it's it's also the other one thing to recognize, like I believe there is a thing called cancel culture and I think mm-hmm. it's bad. And I think it's it's weird that in some ways people are less free to talk openly than they were 20 years ago or 30 years ago or 40 years ago when you you know, when you think about it, you know, George Carlin's great routine about, you know, the seven words you can't say on TV, mm-hmm. it's kind of like what's great is nobody watches TV anymore. So we're free to say those words, but we feel less and less comfortable mm-hmm. saying anything that might be offensive to people. That's a problem. But it's also true that we live in a world where more people can have, they have mics, they have access to mics and to printing presses and to, you know, they can, more people can say, what they really think if mm-hmm. they want to. And right. it's just, it's worrying to me. There's a lot of people who feel terrified to actually talk honestly about things. Well, one thing that's certainly true <clears throat> is that we have more speech than we've ever yeah. had before, you know, at yeah. any point in the, in the history of the world. And uh, I was actually listening to Chris Hayes and mm-hmm. having a conversation with John McWhorter on this subject. And, and part of what Chris was saying is that maybe the, Cases in which we're overreacting or seeming to overreact at, at certain things that people say is just kind of a example of the, you know, the the volume of speech being like waters breaking the dam of right, our right. ability to sort of react to things, you mm-hmm. know, uh, with with proper proper proportionality. What do you say though to somebody who makes the point that, look, for somebody who is, I mean, whether you're you know, trans or somebody mm-hmm. from the LGBTQ community or possibly, you know, racial minority and so forth. You don't have to go back very far in time to see certain words that were normative in our culture, mm-hmm. but that were perhaps also very offensive. 
mm-hmm. um, that, you know, made life uncomfortable for people in, in certain mm-hmm. circumstances. Uh, and, uh, you know, um, there's a certain amount of social pressure that should be brought to bear in order to get folks yeah. to sort of treat each other with the kindness and tolerance that maybe is a part of libertarian culture. This idea that mm-hmm. we can show up as who we are as individuals, but that we have to push back against the repressive cultural norms that allow mm-hmm. that to be the case, um, is the idea that we should throw open the, the floodgates for every sort of term of disparagement. Uh, yeah, no, in the and, name and of freedom, that or? is, you know, I when I when I think about freedom of speech, I'm not thinking, oh, you know, if only I could say the N word all the time <laughs> or something like it. You know, I could curse as much as Miss miss those good old days. Yeah, or, you know, like if I could curse as much as uh, Lil Uzi Vert or something, then I right. you know my I would finally be free. No, so it that's isn't, not the idea. Yeah, it isn't and it, you know and it's not about particular words. This is part of the problem mm-hmm. is that right. like we are focused where we can do keyword searches even on audio transcripts, you know, to, to like, oh, this person said something that's offensive. Mm -hmm. Um, Sometimes in the past, I mean, one of the weirdest cases of cancel culture, uh, last year, a guy who, you know, was an old man who worked at Boeing as their communications Mm -hmm. director, he had, he got fired after an article he wrote for a military journal. He had been in the Air Force um, in the late 80s, he had written an editorial saying that women shouldn't be in combat positions. Mm-hmm. At the time, that was a completely majority position. Okay. He even, you know, he changed that a couple of years later, but it somehow came up and helped lead to his ouster at Boeing as a PR guy, mm. you know, in, in 2020. That's the kind of process that there's something wrong and, and screwed up going on in our culture when we're doing that. But more mm. broadly... I think there is, you know, what a lot of the um, uncomfortableness about conversations have to do with, um, you know, if if you don't feel like you can talk about what's bugging you or mm-hmm. what the problem is, um, because you're going to get shouted down as a racist, as an elitist, as this, as that, um, you know, I think that's a problem in the same way that, like, if you can't, when you see George Floyd being killed... Mm. And you cannot have a protest, mm. um, you know, like that's that's going to cause many more problems than it could ever solve, um, you know, and also. In, but then if we can't have discussions about, OK, what is a protest and what is a riot and things like that? Mm. And there's a lot of um, I think people are feeling, um, you know, and part of it is just cowardice on the part of people refusing to be honest and open about it. But yeah. there's a kind of feeling in a lot of parts of America and on different parts of the political spectrum, you know, that we're not allowed to talk about certain things anymore. Are you therefore more concerned about social censorship or, or legal or state? Yeah. State well, you know, it's, it's interesting censorship. because one of the great libertarian victories of the past 60 years has been, you know, legal free speech, uh, the mm-hmm. Supreme court and, you know, going back to the late fifties where, you know, in, in the late fifties, you couldn't legally publish or no, no American publisher because it was fraught with obscenity charges and, mm-hmm. and trials. No American publisher published Lady Chatterley's Lover, James Joyce's Ulysses, a uh, howl by, um, uh, um, Allen Ginsberg, uh, you know, Tropic of Cancer by Henry Miller. There were a bunch of court cases that led to that changing. And the Supreme Court, especially over the past 10, 20 years, has been fantastic on free speech, even asserting that, you know, you the government doesn't have a right through the idea of campaign finance laws to limit speech in ways that are onerous. We're in a great, legally, we're in a very good uh, situation. We're not, you know, culturally and socially, uh, we're, you know, we've got a tougher uh, road to hoe. And in terms of even things like in the election, you know, it's kind of screwed up that Twitter banned people being able to link to a New York Post story about Hunter Biden and Joe Biden a couple mm. of weeks before the election or a few days before the election. Um, you know, Twitter, that's their right. I mean, these these are like private platforms and things like that. But the idea that they would feel a need to do that mm. is a little bit troubling to me. Well, and do you look at them as being merely private companies or do you give any credence to the argument that says that functionally speaking, yeah. these are utilities that. Yeah, you know, no, I, I and, uh, you know, and this is this is also one of the reasons you can, you know, you can just as you, you know, you can always find something to agree with and disagree with with mm-hmm. a libertarian. You can always expect libertarians to ultimately be, you know, defending the most hated 
kind of person in America <laughs> right. at any given time out of principle. Sure. There is no way that Twitter and YouTube and Facebook are public utilities. Okay, mm -hmm. they just aren't because you can start new things. And as Twitter gets crummier and crummier, Clubhouse appears. Mm. You know, it's like there will always be another place to go right. when things get bad enough. And the other thing is like, you know, uh, and this is particularly um, uh, disturbing to me that conservatives now, and this is people like Marco Rubio, Ted Cruz, Josh Hawley, are, uh, you know, um, uh, Richard Epstein, the legal scholar, uh, Clarence Thomas, the Supreme Court Justice, our Senator start... Rubio, you are free to appear on the Brave Angels podcast to respond to any of Nick Gillespie's criticisms. Let me just <laughs> announce that. Um, so, uh, but, you know, they're saying, oh, these are like common carriers and they should be treated like that. It's like, mm -hmm. these are these are all people who are old enough to remember what it was like when AT&T was the, you know, had a monopoly on phone service. Mm -hmm. And what that meant was for like 60 or 70 years, there was no real innovations. There were no real you know anything it's like and right. these are the same people who championed ronald reagan getting rid of the fairness doctrine and, and opening up deregulation of various kinds of communication um so having said that that isn't to say that these groups don't have a lot of power over how we communicate yeah, because i'm not i mean correct me if i'm no. wrong but was there ever any point at which at&t was sort of selectively seeming to abridge or otherwise kind of no no but the... what it what it meant was that you there could be no alternatives to right. at&t mm -hmm. and and at&t famously like what you do is when you create a common carrier and you say okay you're gonna you you have to allow all this this and this like then you know among other things the government creates a monopoly or, or enables one and that monopoly doesn't do anything it's not mm -hmm. going to improve its service right. um you know this is that, you know, when people, you know, just go back and look at, uh, you know, I've mentioned George Carlin, another old comedian, Lily Tomlin, mm -hmm. one of her stock characters on Laughing was a phone operator whose, you know, whose gag line, whose joke line was like, we don't have, you know, we're the phone company, we don't have to, mm -hmm. uh, you know, she was a customer <laughs> service rep, you right. know, and it's like, yeah. um, and so it's much better, I think, to talk about how do we make it easier for people to innovate free speech spaces? Mm. How do we, within the communities of places like Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, whatever, how do we voice our concerns in a powerful way, in a way that gets the culture and those people to start being more open to divergent points of view? That's the only way forward, mm. gotcha. as far as I'm concerned. Because once you get the government involved saying, okay, this is good speech or bad speech, or this is how you have to run your business, which is what this is about, um, you know, that's, you know, that's, it's a bad thing. It, it, nothing gets better when the government is telling you, okay, yes, you can allow that, you can't allow this, or, you know, you, you get into trouble if you don't do the things we tell you to do. Mm, gotcha. Hey, you were recently on uh, Dave Rubin's yeah. uh, podcast, and I was, before you got here to the studio, I was, took a couple minutes and I was looking at you mm -hmm. and Michael Shermer talking about the intellectual dark web and some, mm -hmm. some other things. Um, and uh, I, I think you, you and I, I mean, we are connecting sort of through the milieu of the heterodox kind of mm -hmm. you know, online yep. digital ecosystem. Um, you know, Braver Angels is obviously a bipartisan right. grassroots organization. We've got all sorts of folks who are involved, uh, but many of us are meeting online through mm -hmm. social media, so on and so forth. And around the sort of gatekeeping of the legacy mm -hmm. outlets and institutions, um, there's, so there's so much energy, right? So it seems like there's a real hunger that people have to connect with each other more deeply, mm -hmm. to have conversations that explore the different frontiers of political and social imagination. But do you have the sense that this heterodox energy in America uh, either is or could build towards something, you know, in the way mm -hmm. of political or social shift um, that begins to seriously answer some of these questions with respect to the breakdown of our ability to reason together, mm -hmm. to keep it on brand, or to just sort of get along and maintain the uh, connective tissue of democracy mm -hmm. is this space leading towards something that could be you know could be a bit transformational yeah i i really i hope so and you know when you you mentioned you know just in our conversation here you mentioned people like john mcwhorter you mentioned people like dave rubin mm -hmm. um you know and michael Shermer, and i and you know say myself like i don't know that we have a lot in common other than a kind of belief in free speech mm -hmm. uh, or free expression and that 
it's better to, you know, let, you know, it's better to have a society where people are doing different things and talking about it mm -hmm. rather than saying, okay, there is one way to live. There is one way to think, there is one way to speak and that's it. I think it's a real challenge because it, within that heterodox space, which I think is a great way to think about it, where it's mm -hmm. just like, okay, you know, people don't want to be told how to, what to think, what they can do, what they can't do. Um, there's, there's a large group of people who are kind of fed up with right wing or left wing political correctness of mm. saying, well, you know, you, you, you know, you can't talk about this. If you're on my, if you're in my tribe, when you're on my reservation, you know, you're not going to be talking about evolution, you know, mm. and then if you're mm. on the other side, you can't talk about religion or something like that. One of the problems is, is that, you know, there, this is like a, this is kind of like a, um, an undergirding of like what we need to come to. And I think what we need to all be promoting is that framework of an America that you were getting at where mm -hmm. it's an America where there is a, a baseline commitment to certain kinds of principles, broad mm -hmm. principles, but then there's a healthy support for people who disagree fundamentally about a lot of stuff to live side by side in view of one another. Because if you're, if you're building a community or a society that is really good. Like I, I can look at that and I can, you know, I can opt into yours or I can yeah. learn from it and bring some of it to mind. If you are, you know, the Roanoke, Virginia, the lost colony of Virginia, you know, or Jamestown and you mm -hmm. kill the Indians who are bringing you food. Like I want to be able to see that and learn from your bad example and vice mm -hmm. versa. And I think that's one of the things that is particularly interesting about America right now is that we don't have a shared vision of what it means to be an American, warts and all. Like, what is our large history? What are our strengths? What is the kind of genius of this experiment that allows, you know, us to do well? Um, and at various points, we we've never had a perfect answer, and they always end. But you know, there was that kind of <clears throat> frontier or settler, you know, a wasp, you know, a, a white man moving to the frontier and creating new space, and you know, blah blah blah, or something, or a theocracy, you know, a shining city on the hill. There was, and this is the world that I grew up in, partly because of my uh, grandparents being immigrants, but the time I was born of and, and living on the East Coast, um, you know, uh, America was a nation of immigrants. And, mm -hmm. you know, and so everybody comes here with nothing and then they gain things and they learn and they become different because, you know, like you show up here and you're Italian, you, sh you know, and then, you know, in two generations, you are four or five different ethnicities or whatever mm -hmm. that narrative has died um we're now in one where it seems like um you know there there are kind of um people who are pushing an idea that america is a particularly evil country and mm -hmm. that what it its main process has to be to pay reparations literally or figuratively to people who have been historically harmed others are saying you know what america we need to wall ourselves off from the world because we've become too polyglot we've become too um, you know, kind of uh, multi-ethnic to a point where we don't know what we are anymore. Uh, we need a new narrative. But I think anything that is, you know, is where the, the first thing that we need to do is to come up with a, a framework that allows us to have a lot of different people, you know, committed to kind of peaceful coexistence, uh, to respect, to tolerance, to pluralism, mm. to dialogue in a lot of ways. And then let's let's go from there and that's what the heterodox space of a bunch of people who probably politically don't have all that much in common or culturally mm -hmm. don't have that much in common if we can agree to that yeah. you know then i think we have the building block of the next stage of things mm. and my hope is that that heterodox sort of circumference of of civic dialogue mm -hmm. is able to expand to sort of bring in more and more of the most politically kind of disaffected people mm -hmm. you know in or maybe sort of outside of you know that that center of the conversation. I think that there's a story to be told for a lot of working class mm -hmm. white folks uh, in America and Appalachia and the Rust Belt mm -hmm. and so forth, just like there's a story to be told, certainly, uh, for black folks and Latinos mm -hmm. and people of color in inner city and urban America that sort of shines a light on how it is that so much of our recent history has kind of cut people out from the opportunities that would allow them to feel fully right. invested in America as a project right and yeah, yeah no and that's you know this is i mean it's it's hard to figure this out i like how to do it but you know so many 
kind of, you know, and I, I, I lived in a lot of different parts of the country, including Southern California and Appalachia mm. and, um, uh, you know, the, the Northeast tech, small town in Texas. So many people are convinced that they are the group that is being screwed over and that is paying for everything else, you know, and it's right. like blacks, blacks are paying through the sweat of their um, predecessors labor and, you know, and by police violence against them. You know, if you talk to like white people in Kentucky and the Ohio River Valley, they feel like they've played by the rules and the country mm -hmm. has just, you know, screwed mm -hmm. them over. And now they're taking everything that was promised them and giving it to somebody else. Everybody's pissed. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, that's in a way that's a sign like that, you know, current, you know, w the stories we're telling ourselves aren't working. I mean, mm -hmm. I actually think if you look at a material level, people continue to do better and better. You know, for the most part, we're living longer. Mm -hmm. We have more stuff. Um, you the know, Stephen the, Pinker analysis. Yeah, I mean, yeah, bro, you know, we're, it's more peaceful. Mm -hmm. um, you know, generally speaking, you know, pe mm -hmm. but we don't have a story that makes sense of that. And mm -hmm. as a result, we have a lot of groups that are really at each other's throats. Or they, you know, and we need to have better conversations across groups. Right. Um, and then we need to develop a story, which is not, not a fantasy. It's not a myth, but that makes it possible so that people aren't like, you know, this ship is going down or it's like, you know, we're, we're locked in a cabin in the winter mm -hmm. and, you know, there's enough food for five people and there's 10 people at the table. Like how, who do we kill or who do we eat? <laughs> like we, right. we have to come up yeah. with a different way of talking about America. And I, um, yeah, I mean, this is not particularly libertarian, I guess, um, other than that it falls from a kind of vision of creative destruction applied to the cultural arena, rather, or, mm -hmm. or to the um, uh, kind of ethnic and cultural arena. We can be as, Gillespie, and it's fine. Yeah, yeah okay. No, but I mean, it, it pains me to think that, um, you know, like, we, we seem to have believed that all progress in America has stopped, progress towards equality, right. uh, progress towards recognition economic progress and now we are you know we're like we're playing the blame game uh, and none of this is to to like you know uh say there isn't a lot of stuff in the past we need to acknowledge and there aren't things going on right now mm. that we need to change i mean the libertarian project is all about how do we get rid of dumb laws that are screwing over people's abilities to to create the life they want to live right um but um yeah it's uh you know it's amazing i mean i'm i'm I was the second generation born in America. And I mean, my grandparents had nothing. My parents had even less because they lived through the depression. I'm doing pretty well. Uh, you know, I'm doing very well. And like, we need to think, okay, what worked, what didn't. And like, mm -hmm. how do we keep that going? And it's, you know, it's, it's amazing to think that we are, you know, we, we are like a country that is acting as if it is over and we're fighting over, mm -hmm. you know, the last, you know, um, last slice of pizza. Yeah. Isn't that something mm -hmm. that we could be so hopeless and still sort of, you know, have so much, but yeah. everybody's got their struggle and, um, God, we've gotten all the way to the end of the conversation here and you and I haven't even touched on the war on drugs and, and all of that. So. Yeah. Well, this is one thing it is ending, you know, this is the other thing to think about, I guess, more broadly is that, so many of the things, especially if you were born and raised in the 20th century, primarily, you're younger and you have mm. a, more of a future. But like, you know, the, you know, uh, Time magazine, Henry Luce used to call the 20th century the American century. And like in a profound way, the American century is over and that's a good thing. But we need to be thinking about, OK, you know, what what comes next? And it's a different type of America. We don't have to run the world. Uh, we don't have to run the economy. We don't have to make everybody be like us mm -hmm. um what we need to do is to figure out how do we like allow each of us to become more whoever we want to be mm. um and and have those conversations it's um it's stunning to me uh and it's it's kind of wonderful like the the george floyd you know killing by the police was was awful mm. um one thing that is you know we're talking not too far from where Rodney King was beaten mm -hmm. you know, in, in 1991 by the LAPD. People looking at the Rodney King beating and everything that came out of that, they were like, I don't know, you know, like this was a complicated situation. People, everybody agrees, you know, pretty much that Derek Chauvin acted terribly and that a system that ends with George Floyd being killed in that way mm. 
is you know it's it's got to be fixed and and there's a lot of you know there's a lot more to be said about that mm -hmm. there is so much progress in terms of um inclusion uh you know we're not racist we're not sexist we're not homophobic uh, we're not xenophobic in the way that we were mm -hmm. you know 50 years ago um and that's not enough but like you know we're we're at, at the same time instead of having more conversations across divides it seems like we're trying to you know, shut down any conversation that makes anybody uncomfortable for any moment. Right. Yeah. Well, the the, the word dignity seems key hmm. to me. It, it seems to me like we have to find our way to a place to where whatever the social arrangements that we have with each other wind up looking like as matters of policy, that they allow for some sort of cultural interaction that enables us to affirm the dignity in one another. Yep. Right. And, um, you know, in so doing, allow ourselves to keep, keep, uh, keep space with, with each other. Right. Because just to your point, for all of the material progress that we've made, and it is measurable. Now, that's not to say that, you know, the, the growth of GDP right. does not obscure all sorts of other right. realities yeah, about, yeah. you know, lack of social mobility or, you know, health care disparities, mm -hmm. this, that generational wealth, all of these things. But what's true is that, you know, uh, man cannot live by bread alone. Right. Right. There is, I think, you know, e even if we're only using this term metaphorically, some spiritual sort of thing. That no, I, I totally agree. Yeah. And people, this, right? you know, and this is partly, you know, instead of seeing it as a crisis, we can maybe say it, it's the triumph of, mm -hmm. of a victory over material needs. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're all existentialists now. We're, mm -hmm. we're, you know, way up on Maslow's, you know, pyramid or hierarchy mm -hmm. of needs. Right. We're not scrambling. You know, I mean, my grandparents, like, literally, I, you know, I, one of my grandfathers dug basements by hand. I mean, that mm -hmm. was his job. Like, you know, doing that for like 10 or 12 or 14 hours a day doesn't leave a lot of time to think about, you know, oh, who, do, who do I want to be or what are my aspirations? Right. It's like you're lucky mm -hmm. if you can sleep and get up the mm -hmm. next day. Sure. As a society, and again, not to obscure, you know, real problems, uh, you know, in part in mm -hmm. among, you know, different areas and stuff. But it's like we're all way up here now. And what we are lacking is that kind of ability to understand what, you know, how do we live a symbolically meaningful life, mm. a rich life, and one, you know, that, that reflects the fact that we want our work now to express our values. It's mm. not simply that we want to have enough money. Uh, you know, we want better for our children, and it gets harder and harder. You know, if, if you're upper middle class, it's harder and harder to envision a world where your kids are going to do better than you because, mm. like, you know, what's left to do? And, and I, again, I don't want to minimize any of this stuff, but, like, you know, what we're looking at now, which is different than I think generations past, is it is a crisis of meaning. Yeah. Um, and we we have not even begun to acknowledge that. And so we end up having a lot of really bad conversations that don't advance anything other than some people's need, you know, willing or desire to maintain power and kind of mm. flex in a particular moment to keep more power for them or more money or more status or whatever. Mm, right. Yeah, exactly. So the pathway towards finding that meaning, I suspect, yeah. has to involve us, you know, has to involve us having some relationship with each other to where we can help kind of bring that out yeah. to each other, I imagine. Because we are our own greatest resources in some sense, right? Yeah, I mean, for it's, sure. It's hard to imagine a life of meaning that wasn't defined in part by your relationships with your friends, your family. Right. You know, yeah. with folks who you want to build together right. with. I yeah. think with that, you know, that is absolutely an insight that needs to be at the center of anything. And then also a kind of, you know, and, and this is the libertarian in me, um, you know, a depoliticization of everything and every, you know, <laughs> everything. Because, and that's not to say, you know, that's not so, uh, you know, I, I hate, I'm a big sports fan and I hate when people are like, you know, I hate when sports get political or something, mm. because like, you know, if you were a major league baseball fan, you know, mm. up until 19, you know, until Jackie Robinson, until baseball was integrated, baseball was making the most virulent political statement with every game, which is that right. like, mm -hmm. we're not letting the best players play where, you know, this is for white guys only. And then, you know, occasionally you could slip a Cuban in, you know, or something <laughs> like that. If you, if you represented a black guy, you know, as a foreigner or something for at least for a couple of games. 
you know, but we need to depoliticize stuff so that it isn't, you know, so that we can actually have more contact with people and develop better bonds and better connections and better solutions mm-hmm. and more interesting things, you mm-hmm. know, because that's the, you know, and, and until we are willing to um, step outside of our political tribes and our political identities that are so hardened and so nasty that we don't even talk to people we disagree with, we just mm-hmm. scream at them and fling, you know, feces at them like a bunch of howler yeah. monkeys or something. Um, you know, we're, we're not going to get very far. Well, and perhaps perhaps the irony there is that the constructive way to go about depoliticizing the things that we would not want to see politicized is to perhaps conversely open up the space for us to be able to find each other in the constructive dialogues yep. that mm-hmm. need to take place as well, right? Because that steam's got to come out yeah, yeah, somewhere, absolutely. right? Yeah. Otherwise, it just blows up everywhere, yeah. you know, so... Yeah. Indeed. All right, man. Well, by the time we're finished with our second conversation, I expect we will have <laughs> solved the nation's uh, Okay, the nation's or we'll have problem. at least addressed a specific policy <laughs> issue that we can talk about. Yeah, I do it. like, you know, I think one of the, the and not just to, um, you know, kind of gild your uh, lily here or anything, but what mm-hmm. I like about Braver Angels, and there are other groups doing this type of stuff, when you have debates or conversations, mm-hmm. like actual debates, and say, okay, you know what, like we have disagreements here. Um, you know, I come from uh, an immigrant, uh, you know, East Coast family where, you know, it, it's like the Costanzas on Seinfeld where, mm-hmm. you know, screaming and yelling is, you know, the, the baseline. Right. Um, you, you, you don't get anywhere by, uh, you know, by pretending nothing is wrong. Right. Mm-hmm. Like and having, you know, starting having debates with people who disagree about stuff to air the different sides and take the mm-hmm. take the temperature of the room, you know, and like, do you agree? Do you disagree? And then beyond that, then you can also have less kind of, um, uh, you know, confrontational conversations. And then, you know, I mean, like there's so many ways to do it. And this is where, you know, if maybe the problem is we have too much speech, not that we have too little speech. (laughs) Um, Maybe the problem is that we don't have enough debate Mm. uh, and we should have more debate. And because we this is technologically as well as culturally, we're in a we're in an era where you know, you can have the greatest debates all the time. You know, Mm -hmm. I I mean, it's really easy and we should be talking more, um, you know, rather than trying to shut down people from talking more. That's right. There's nothing wrong with fighting. We've just got to figure out the right way to have the fight. Right. So, indeed. Mr. Gillespie, pleasure to be able to meet you in person, man. Haven't done too many of these uh, lately. Well, uh, yeah, no, that's, uh, (laughs) you know, this is, let's come out of COVID, uh, you know, uh, with with a uh, you know really energized to uh, talk more in person, I think that's also mm-hmm. helpful. I mean, I, I love cyberspace, but it's supplemental. Mm-hmm. It's not it's not the first thing. Yeah, that's right. Well, Nick has had his shots. He's had mm-hmm. he's you know he's, I had COVID. I mean, so, it, well, so did I. So yeah, did I, so right? we're, yeah, yeah. exactly. So just letting folks know we're 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 doing it right, doing it, <laughs> playing it by the book. But I really do look forward to the day when we can do more of these things mm. in person because we've got to get back out of our doors again, I mm-hmm. think, um, you know, while taking care of each other. So, yeah. Nick, really appreciate you coming by and Thank being you. on. And for folks who are watching and listening, if you are appreciative of the mission of Braver Angels, if you want to get involved in our work to restore the spirit of American democracy, you can join us as a member, braverangels.org. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to this podcast. We are building a house united. Until next time.